All right, so good afternoon. My name is Tina Herbert, um, and I'm so glad to have you all here. Um, and from the information that you all received, the purpose or intent for today is for um, churches or nonprofits who want to get into single family home development. Um, just a survey of folks. How many of you all were here during our first Let's Build Together? Wow, this is so interesting. And the only reason I say that, we probably had like 60 or so folks at the first one. Um, and so then we did a survey. I'm kind of giving you all a little bit of the background. Um, at that first one, and you can see that on our website, but we talked about various ways. Oh, here's the mayor. We talked about various ways. Mayor Rickman. Um, I was giving them a recap from the last one. We talked about various ways that folks could develop the property and uh, build up their community. But I want to take a quick break and welcome up uh, Mayor Rickman, doing it right, to come up and give a brief welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see everybody. How about it? Right. A little, little warm today, but you know, I heard we're going to get another little wave coming in and to get us back into the 70s where we want to be. But. Uh, I did want to obviously welcome you all today, but also really thank you for being here. This is the most important thing that we can be doing is working together to build one house, one block at a time and rebuilding our city. As you know, we have been invested heavily of really trying to figure out how do we help forward our, our community and housing is a big issue. You know, it's close somewhere between 16 and, and 15,000 homes needed over the next decade. But what's interesting is we got close to 2,100 empty lots across our city. A lot of them owned, privately owned. So how do we work with those folks and how do we engage folks to, to rebuild our community? Uh, we need single family homes, we need quadruplexes, we need town homes, we need duplexes, we need, we need a plethora of items. We need homes that our seniors can move into in their neighborhoods, they don't have to leave their support system. Um, so we've got to be creative and we've got to work together to do that and it's going to take all of us to do it. So, you know, I just really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here and engaged in that. Uh, I think I've been to four meetings in two days all surrounded future housing and what people can do with existing land and what they need to help and introducing them in a cross section from mortgage companies to construction companies. Also uplifting the standard of what what we consider attainable housing. Uh, we've seen some really good projects and we've seen some really not so good projects. We want to make sure all future projects are great and they emulate a, a, a great community and they build a thriving society but also builds up the individuals. So yes, we need rentals and we need home ownership as well. As you know, we have less than 50, 47% uh, of all the homes are owned in our community, 53 are rental. I'd like to see that closer to 50-50. You know, that's, a, I think, achievable goal for us to get to is create more home ownership prop. We're doing that as a city with some projects I know you'll hear about later on, but I think there's opportunities where we can step in and help as well to make sure that happens. A lot of federal programs, a lot of our lending institutions now also realize how important it is that they invest in our communities in all of our communities not just one section so uh, um so how we kind of got here um because I, I did a little survey so only two two folks who've been to the first one that we did um uh, that when i asked that question then i need a uh, affirmative response i'm sorry i'm a oh. lawyer <laughs> and i do this every day i'm like the court reporter cannot hear you so I think we had two people who have been to the original, the first one. All right, so in the first one, we showed very different things. We showed multifamily developments. We showed, um, if you don't want to do development at all and you just want to help upfit, if you want to do um, roofs and stuff for seniors, we, we showed basically just about everything you can do. This one session is specifically if you want to get into um, single family homes. Um, single family homes, and I'm glad that Daniel um, mentioned 2,100 empty lots. Please raise your hand if you have some empty lots within the, is that the city or the city and county? City only. 
Raise your hand if you own some of the. Oh, look, look, Daniel, Shanique, make sure you grab these names. <laughs> no, but this is good um, because it's one of the things people think is that the city is going to come in and solve all the problems, but the city cannot. And I often tell people you don't want the city to solve all the problems because that's the government, um, and and that's not necessarily what we need in all situations. So. We're going to work on our lots, and you all will hear Mr. Lawton when he talks about that. Um, but we also want to help you find ways to work on your lots. Um, so a couple of reasons when I ran, I ran on equity, empowerment, and economics. And one of my very, very specific goals was increasing home ownership in the minority community. Um, I do not need to give statistics on the gap. Uh, the disparity in wealth, um, and what is the number one a uh, way to develop, build wealth in America. I need I need everyone to respond and say it like you know it. Uh, no, it's home ownership. Okay, pop quiz. What's number two? Business ownership, small business, and and not working for someone else, and even if it's just a side gig. Um, and so in my, I have a part of my life that I work on that too. But increasing wealth, and to me, this is a very tangible way that we can change the trajectory of several people's lives. Um, I would tell people, I don't need to have 100,000 people buying homes. I, if, I mean, literally, if you have 15 people, think about the family circle that you are helping with that. Um, one of the things I really, really like too is we always talk about the state of our youth. And I'm, I'm big on what are we going to do with our, I used to be a juvenile public defender, if any of y'all. And, and you deal with families and a lot of the issues that they're confronted. Um, and so what everyone is saying these days is that, you know, whatever happened to, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, what I have learned, and this is, this is honestly my true experience, um, my mama, okay, my mama said she was coming, but she's not here, and I'm glad. Uh, well, no, because we moved around a lot. And so I lived in uh, Greenview, Lincolnshire, wait, Greenview twice, Lincolnshire, Meadow Lakes twice, Denny Terrace, Chris, why are you smiling and laughing? <laughs> Denny Terrace, Seminary Ridge, um, Colonial Drive twice before I purchased my home. Okay, and that was with my mom because I stayed with my mom all those years, and I didn't understand the impact of that until I came back and I started campaigning, and I'm knocking on doors in Greenview, and no one remembers me and my family because we were renters. I mean, just to be honest, they they didn't remember us, and they they would ask, "Who are your family folks?" Um, and so I got to see myself. Like, they don't remember me because we weren't embedded in the community. So here is the difference, and this is my philosophy. I'm going to state that it's a fact, but it's my philosophy. Um, if you have lived next door to someone, and I don't care if they're renting or purchasing, it doesn't matter, but if you have stayed um, across the street from them for two weeks and you see the little boy showing out, how likely are you to go and confront the little boy? Good <laughs> but, but, but say that one more time, Kelvin. You had better not. Better not. But however, if y'all have lived across the street and you know the family and y'all been there 20 years, right? Boy, you told yourself. Exactly. And so that is, that is my philosophy, and I'm calling it a fact, um, that of how we have lost our villages. Um, and especially for the generation and, and the kids that we are talking about. So when I say I'm all about affordable housing, building wealth, creating sustainability, it's a bigger picture than just putting up some houses. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to our um, next speaker, our first speaker. I generally like to be out on time. What time are we scheduled to be out? Four. Oh, four o'clock? Let me stop talking. Um, <laughs> well, no, I will tell you, because um, I want to get through the presentations, the group is possibly small enough that we may be able to actually ask questions and engage, but it depends on if I stop talking now and I let the presenters provide the information that they have. 
Um, but I do want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers. And just kind of wanted to get give y'all a little bit of my spirit. You probably get more and more of my spirit over the next hour. Um, one thing I just wanted to make sure that we have a sign-in sheet and we're collecting info. Okay. All righty. I'm going to um, welcome up Mr. Tony Lawton. And his um, topic, I gave you this topic just so you know, um, is is starting with a good foundation. I just want to thank Councilman Herbert for inviting me, the mayor. I've been on a little circuit here lately, moving around, talking about the various uh, development throughout the city. And so when she talked about starting with a good foundation, starting with a good foundation is, hey, you got to have the, the property, the land, in order to be able to do what it is that you want to do. Because you guys are nonprofit, things of that nature, the next good thing would be is to have a 501c3, that's a nonprofit organization again, depending on how you would like to move around and do things of that nature. Um, this is the clicker for me to move forward. Um, uh, Mr. Lawton, I was going to serve as your assistant. Oh, I okay, had thank already. you. Thank you. And if you just tell me, not unless you want to do no, it. No, no, you can do it. You know, I started this thing. She said, uh, Councilwoman said, uh, this is, she was number three. I started 6 3 with Apple. Look at me. I'm five seven ball and fat. So I mean, this is the effect. So this is what you got forward to look forward to. So this is where we are. If you go to the next slide, Val. Yes. And so one of the things uh, we did. So I'm a consultant with the city of Columbia. I've been with the city in a different capacity. Used to be employed with them, as uh, Councilwoman Herbert talked about the ways of creating wealth is home ownership, and then growing out small business. I think I got both of those covered. So when we looked at uh, one of the things the mayor wanted to do is say, we have all these vacant lots. What are we gonna do with the vacant lots that we have? So this is, we looked at the Belmont community, which is in Councilwoman Herbert's district. They had about 25 vacant lots in that community. Those that are in blue is those vacant lots. We had five lots that were non billable so what the city decided to do was, uh, one of the things that we'll do for the community is develop a park. So if you go to the next slide, uh, they, the Belmont community has a, what we call a little pocket park. We use, utilize five of those lots uh, to build that park. I think it's gonna be completed uh, sometime the end of September. September. And so I've been tasked uh, with when that park is completed, start the construction on several houses uh, as we move forward. Next slide. My birthday. Your birthday is? September 26th. We, so, gonna so, so, so we're going to do it for a birthday, September 26th. <laughs> Next slide. So give you a sense of what this looks This is what it looked like in the beginning. Um, they started at through various stages of you see of the development of the park. And um, Ms. Erica said to me, where did I get these pictures from? Was I taking them from out of my uh, out of the car, the window? No, I used my iPad. So, but I think it came up to look pretty good. So, this is uh, some of the slides of the park. There's a gazebo there, um, and it's going to be really nice with a walking trail, so uh, individuals can uh, walk around. Next slide. One quick question. Yes. Um, about how much does it cost for the city to develop? a pocket park or well, something like For that. this park, don't quote me, unless you help me, I think it's about $250,000. Um, now, I've met with several organizations who currently have land that they would like to do uh, develop a park. Is it, Mr. Mayor, the Boyd Foundation? Boyd Foundation is one. Um, and we're looking at some other ways of what we could possibly do to help with trying to develop a, a park uh, okay, in the community. Tony, what goes in a park, uh, pocket park? Is so, like, for, for this one, it's going to be a picnic area, grill. Um, I've talked with uh, Ms. Gentry about possibly playground equipment going in there because of, you know, you have kids, the younger kids, things of that nature. And depending on the neighborhood, uh, this one has a walking trail. So, uh, elderly, they can go through and you know do several laps and, and walk. So what we did is about a year ago, uh, when we saw that we had these 19 lots, we sat down, we sent out a request for a proposal um, to get the construction industry and developers to tell us, you know, what type of things that we could do to develop uh, the lot, homes on those lots. 
So this is one of the renderings that we came up with as related to the homes that will be out in that particular neighborhood. Sat down, met with the neighborhood, showed them the plans, um, got the whole buy-in and tried to fit it in with what the existing community looked like. This may change, but here you see, this is the maple, it's a three bedroom, two bath, 1,200 square feet. Next slide. Oh, then you have, excuse me, back one. The so, uh, Noble is a 13, excuse me, three bedroom, two bath, 1,300 square feet. Next slide. Um, so what we did is we sat down with the uh, contractor, went through the plans and talked about what type of pricing we could get to build those homes. So if you look at uh, the Maple, this uh, about 151,000, the Nobles came in about 160, and the Darcy, I don't have a slide of that one, but it came in about 171,000. Uh, the unique and beautiful thing about this is the city is giving those lots to the homeowner. So that does not include the land as we relate to this development. The second thing is the city had uh, all of the water and sewer because again, there were existing homes there. So they upgraded and uh, the contract can just tap in um, to do the construction there. So we're looking at when we finish a reduction of about 21,000 off of those numbers that you saw previously. So when you sit there and you start looking at this, you look at those numbers. The other unique thing that the city of Columbia has is a housing program that they do internally. I will let Ms. Kilgore talk about that because I want to steal her thunder, but I run with it constantly because there's 4% money that's out there that the city will do. So you take 4% equate to that and we're talking about seven, eight hundred dollars a month for your house payments. The unique thing that was, I'm sorry, can you clarify? You mean four percent interest rate? Interest rate the over, yes, interest rate, and she will keep me on tack, etc. The beautiful thing about that is, when we looked at this, we decided where could we start. The city of Columbia has about twenty-five hundred employees. We started thinking about again, where could you go at to look at um, potential homeowners? right there, so that's a unique situation. So similar to what you guys as nonprofits the church, you already have what base? Your parishioners. Why don't you utilize your parishioners to empower them at the end of the day? So that's the whole concept of having that strong foundation, uh, having your parishioners, um, and then utilizing them to empower them from that standpoint. Next slide. Tommy, this again, I got a question. Yes. That's the power of the city of Columbia and bringing in the number of lots that we had um, and really sitting down and working to the table is, you know, how, how much are they willing to work with us to do the various things that we want to do. One of the things uh, we talked about, call, yeah. so we talked about doing five to ten at a time to keep it, keep it going from there. And I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Lewis. Lewis. Um, we're trying to do one full hour, so if you could write your questions down, I really want to be able to end at four, so no one will say that I kept y'all longer than an hour. But if folks want to stay for questions and answers, then they can do it at the four. All right, and, and I'm, right, I'm bringing it home now. You know, the Lord, I'm running, I'm coming on in. I'm bringing it on in right now. So I got four more minutes. I, four more minutes. <laughs> I, I can do this all day. So when we sit there and look at it, that's one of the unique things that we talked about. Uh, as we relate to that program, so we're looking at the school district. Uh, the school district have uh, foreign exchange teachers, so we're looking at partnering with them. Um, firefighters, law enforcement. I am keep looking over here, Missy and Ms. Kilgore, so I don't say anything and commit them to some things that they're not willing to do. But we talked about a special interest rate for those guys as well, one and two percent. So you think about that, at the end of the day, beat that cost down a little bit more. And Mr. Watt, that's compared to what is the current interest rate? Uh, about five, nine, six interest rate now is coming down. But when you start looking at it from that standpoint, that's what you really want to do. For you churches, your nonprofits, here's another thing you look at. If you start out with renting, you can transition individuals from renting 
own it to home ownership, and you can phase it from that standpoint. I thought I saw someone from the Housing Authority. This person from the Housing Authority here. Yes. So one of the things uh, we talked about, uh, you had the word Section 8 voucher. People get nervous, get afraid as relate to that. A lot of individuals don't know you can use your Section 8 voucher for home ownership. So when you start talking about a foundation, it's about educating individuals of what you can do to use that voucher. I don't want to get in, I like to stay in my lane. So if the Housing Authority want to talk about that a little bit more, they can do that as well, but that's another tool as relate to foundation. You start looking at your parishioners, how many of them you think may have a Section 8 voucher? Again, educating. We talked about the wealth, the foundation. You can transition them from that standpoint right on into the, the home ownership. Um, next slide here. So we know, I know some of you are 501c3. Here's what's so good about this here. A Chodo. Community Housing Development Organization. The unique thing about that is it will allow you to potentially, not guaranteed, be able to get 15% of the home partnership dollars from either the city, the county, or whomever have those dollars. And so, but you have to become a cholo, and that's all about the structure of your organization. I think one third of it has to be low to moderate income. Uh, you can't have no more than a third of elected officials on that board, but HUD has certain requirements, rules as it relate to what become, you know, dictates a cholo. And I think it's a very good tool that you could utilize as a relate to seed money, good foundation to start your development. You could utilize it for acquisition, new home ownership, things of that nature. And so uh, when you create that board, start looking at it from the mindset of where's the money, following those money. Uh, there are banks, as the mayor talked about, that uh, will be willing to partner with you as well um, so that you can go ahead and develop a good foundation from that standpoint. Um, looking at it as, again, the church. When you started the church, what was the first thing you need to do? Yeah, you got your 501c3, but you had your, your membership. Then you went from your membership first to bread. Well, well, we pray, pray that the same. And then, you know, you just, so you build the block the same way. Uh, and that's what we're looking at going. The last thing I would say, uh, for you, those of you in the room, the city of Columbia has an RFQ that's on the street currently right now. As the mayor and councilwoman Herbert talked about, we can't do it all by ourselves, nor do they want to, and you wouldn't want them at the end of the day as well. So this RFQ allows Nonprofits, developers, uh, construction guys to look at the properties that they have, say, hey, I have this idea, I have this property, uh, give us some background information, and we're looking to partner with organizations for the development. You may not be able to do it. So if you're a new 501c3, and I know everybody talks about state housing, the chances are slim to none because you're going to have to have that expertise as related to do this. So take the baby steps. You could partner with a seasoned uh, 501c3 or CHODO and do the development of that standpoint. And you have to make the decision again. You know, pigs get fat, hogs get what? Killed. Slaughtered. So at the end of the day, as you have the properties, things of that nature, you may have to give a little to get a lot. So utilizing the land, um, the developer brings something else. So there's a trade-off. And that's what we did as we relate to developing Belmont. We're going to do that with Booker Washington Heights. We all bring a little something to the table. But at the end of the day, we want a complete meal when we're finished. Thank How many folks already have their nonprofits established? How many are already doing something in housing? I like it. I like it. Because I think the Chodo requirement is at least one year. Yes. Mm -hmm. One year. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not going to get into your stuff. Um, yes. But I was trying to kind of get an idea because Tony is right. Um, you may not want to jump straight into uh, one of the examples we gave last time. 
The first thing you do is a $93 million development. You might, you might not want to start right there. That's kind of hard to do, but it's kind of simple to purchase, um, whether, especially if it's a house that's up for purchase in your neighborhood. Um, and what I also meant to say earlier too is because it gives you the ability to control who's coming in and out of your neighborhood, and that's very important. Um, a lot of times we tend to be on the, um, the side of um, protesting what's coming, but if you're in the ownership position, you determine what's coming. Does that make sense? Um, now, for your um, nonprofits, I used to run my church's CDC, bless God. Um, and no, it was a great experience. I will tell you, um, and you all may already be familiar. Um, um, I came in, well, y'all see how I talk. I, you know, I'm a lawyer and business person, and that's how I spoke um, to the sisters and brothers in Christ. I was cogent, okay. Um, I got several complaints, I'm just gonna tell y'all. Um, and my pastor told me something that I remember to this day. He says, you know, Tina, I need you to help the church run more like business, right? Because this is truly a business. He said, but I need the missionaries to help you learn to run the business with a Christian, you know, more of a Christian spiritual um, insight to it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot. I'll just tell y'all. Honestly, what I did was every email, I just started saying, good morning, sister, such and such. And at the end, have a blessed day. And that really did calm down a lot of folks. <laughs> but it kind of goes to just learning. You know, I, I went in not knowing how they did things. Um, so it was a great experience, um, and it's very interesting. I now want to um, invite up Miss Felicia Kilgore, who has fired me from the clicking <laughs> position before I even started. That's fine, Felicia. Um, but of course, none of these projects, nothing is free. Like none of these projects are free. You have to have some type of funding. And I want Felicia to talk about, Ms. Kilgore, to talk about the funding that is available. Um, and this is kind of important because I've had folks, um, several, you know, when I worked for the city, um, came in and I've just spent you know, six or seven hundred thousand dollars for this property, and now I want the city to develop it. And I remember saying, "Well, all I can give you is two hundred, and that wasn't enough to really do anything." Um, so hopefully, this will help give you some ideas of different routes to take, um, and then kind of figure out what size project you really want to start with. And I do believe I tell y'all, one family. I don't believe that anything is too small. One family. Make sure that's you know maybe that's make sure that that is what your church wants to do. I've also learned that you may say you want to get into housing until you get into housing, and I'm just I mean, I'm just being honest. You say that's what you want to get into until you really get into it. So um, start you know start out small, test test your feet in the waters. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Felicia. Um, I am the director of community development, and so we're going to talk about some financial options that we have through the city um, kind of prepare you a little bit more for it and then of course uh, if you want to dive more deeper into these financial opportunities with the city that's when you can come talk with us directly and we'll guide you um, teach you uh, some of the requirements all those sorts of things so that you you know you're prepared you know to manage those those federal dollars because those are the dollars that we utilize to assist um, nonprofit organization and for-profit organization to build, develop, create new affordable housing units in the city of Columbia. So just to kind of highlight some of the goals that we have in place uh, for the city. Uh, first and foremost, we want to increase um, decent and safe affordable housing. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have gathered here this afternoon to kind of talk about that. Uh, get some additional partnerships in place so that we can uh, increase the number of units uh, to provide. Of course, revitalize neighborhoods. Uh, that's one of the things that Tony mentioned. Uh, we have several lots in place that we are in the process of trying to develop in, um, in th at least three of our neighborhoods that we want to improve. And of course, we'll be utilizing some of our funding to assist with those particular efforts. Uh, provide financial assistance to provide uh, to prevent homelessness, and so we are working with many different um, nonprofit organizations to provide services to folks um, here in the city to help them um, 
to prevent them from becoming homeless. Create jobs and businesses. So we work heavily with our OBO, uh, which is our Office of Business Opportunities uh, Department to offer services for startup businesses uh, and for businesses that need further assistance to improve uh, their business to um, provide more jobs, opportunities for um, the residents here. And then of course provide permanent housing for persons living with AIDS. Uh, one of the programs that we receive from HUD, which is our HOPWA uh, program, which is housing opportunity for persons with AIDS. So we utilize those dollars uh, to provide services, um, housing opportunities for um, people, suffering, people and families suffering uh, with AIDS. Um, financial assistance to prevent homelessness, um, oh, I mentioned that, and then provide quality of uh, supportive services for clients um, achieving and maintaining housing stability. Okay, so uh, of course we administer federal dollars. Uh, we receive funds from, from HUD, which is from our Community Development Block Grant, we refer to it as CDBG, uh, in our office, as well as HOME. Uh, which is also referred to as Home Investment Partnership Program, and then HAQWA. So those are the three main entitlement dollars that we, uh, that we administer. Okay, so what's available? You know, what's out there for you to apply for? Uh, what's up for grabs in terms of um, grant dollars to assist you in um, developing, creating some affordable housing units. And so uh, we place a NOFA um, out on the streets, basically inviting nonprofit, for profit organizations um, to apply for $3.5 million uh, just a few months ago. As a matter of fact, it was in um, October, is when we um, had that, um, that workshop for applications. And so we um, opened it up for a few months for our organization to apply. We did have um, two good, strong applications to come through, and we have actually have moved forward to award those applications. Um, in total, I think we have $3 million already committed um, to support affordable housing, one being um, 10 Development Corporation. They're building nine new single-family homes. Um, in the city for single family home ownership. And tell them what TN Development is. So TN Development is a entity of the city. Um, they have um, been a partner of ours for 15 years maybe, 15, Close. 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, and their mission is to provide affordable housing where it is um, rental and they have several um, um, uh, developments in in the city that um, rent out to single family low to moderate income individuals and families and of course they have developed over the years um, single family units um, houses and they sold to low to moderate income individuals and many times when they develop single family homes just as Tony mentioned we do have a special program that we utilize to assist individuals in purchasing those houses um, that we're very proud of. It's called the Affordable Housing Loan Program, uh, where we work individually in our office with those folks to get them qualified to purchase a home, where it's only required from $500 down. We finance the entire purchase price uh, at a very special interest rate. Um, not quite at 1% to 2%, but it has been at 3%, which is outstanding now compared to where rates are falling. Rates are around 6 7% now. And no PMI. So you can imagine you know, how attractive that is and, and, and makes it a little bit easy and affordable for folks to get into those houses. And so, um, I'm rambling now, but we are proud of that program and how we assist folks in buying homes in the city. So I just had to mention that. So eligible projects, uh, what projects are, are a qualifier for our home dollars? And this is how we utilize those funds, new construction, Rehabilitation, where she can purchase a home and we'll help you re re rehab it. You know, we provide you dollars to rehabilitate it. Um, now these are federal dollars. So they have to be rehabbed a certain way and we will provide you standards 
and we go over those types of standards with you on how they are to be rehabbed. We want to ensure that they're energy efficient, um, you know, all codes are, are addressed, but we provide funding for all of that. So, um, so we, we help you completely along the way in terms of um, providing you the dollars to assist you. Single family homes for home ownership. So those are the three uh, activities that we utilize our home dollars to assist with affordable housing. Of course, if you utilize your, our funding to um, construct new units and so you sell them to um, a low to moderate income individual, they have to utilize that property for home ownership. So we don't want to see where they purchased a home, stay in it for two, three years, turn around and rent it out. So we want to ensure that um, you know, they understand when, once they purchase one of those houses, they have to utilize it for home ownership. And of course, if it's a rental unit, it's a rental unit. Um, just like in a standard unit um, that is managed, um, you know, they can come and go, it's a rental unit. So a few of the other elder activities, acquisition, demolition, construction, rehabilitation, and site improvement. So we provide assistance for all those different activities and costs. All right, financial terms. Uh, we work with nonprofits and for-profit, as I mentioned. Um, so um, generally nonprofit organizations do uh, receive a little bit more attractive terms. Um, interest rate is a little bit less working with nonprofit you notice it's at two percent and then for profit we do charge a little bit more for those guys uh, we charge them at a 3.5 interest rate um, on their funding so some of those dollars I got three minutes two minutes okay 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 so we want to ensure that your project is affordable um, that everything cash flows so we do look at it and we kind of, um, it goes to an underwriting process so that we, sh we can verify that all your costs involved in those projects, uh, that you can still, you know, earn something, you know, as you manage those units. So a lot of times we may look at a grant and loan. So we'll, there's some flexibility of, of being able to provide a grant in terms of your project as well. Okay, some financial terms. Uh, we generally structure your loan for 20 years. Most time it's 30. Uh, it's based on um, the costs and expenses involved. And then of course, once your project's complete, we'll give you 90 days of not having to debt service anything. Uh, that'll give you an opportunity to kind of earn a little bit uh, while you have rented your unit out. And then of course, um, if we award you funds uh, with the city, we do not like to see home funds from other um, participating jurisdiction like Richland County or Lexington County. Um, you, know, if, if, you know, if those were an opportunity for you. And of course, um, if you utilize our dollars, we want sure that there's a restricted covenant in place to kind of help track and enforce the affordability of, of that home and the dollars that is used and invested. Real quickly, these are some of the projects that we have assisted in past years. Uh, this is over in the Edisto area here. Um, it was 22 units for a um, little over $5 million there. And these are... How many units was that? I think it was 22. 22 units. 22 units. Yeah, 22 units. 22 units. $5.3 million. Just, I just wanted to throw those numbers out. Mm -hmm. And those are really nice. They were nicely done. Uh, we work with an organization um, out of Greenville, Homes of Hope. These are our two development corporation, TN, uh, which two notch, we refer to as TN many times. And of course, our Columbia Empowerment Zone, zero minutes. And these are just some of the units that, um, and projects that we have assisted. I'm gonna mention this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down, yes. Tina. So, South Carolina Housing, I have Ms. Renee Long here. She's from South Carolina Housing with us today. And so these are various programs that is offered through South Carolina Housing Authority that is designed to assist with affordable housing. Uh, the LIHTC, as Tony mentioned, those are the most robust, robust type programs. It is designed for uh, more experienced um, um, developers, uh, organizations 
That means you've been doing this for a while, okay? Because they really do underwrite those, underwrite those programs and they look at your level of experience and you have to have some dollars, okay, in order to participate in that program. And then of course we have um, our multi, uh, multi-family tax exempt uh, bond financing, which is also falls in line with the tax credit um, home ARP dollars that we've received, the state received, the home investment partnership program, which is what I mentioned, that the city also received dollars on an annual basis. The South Carolina Housing Trust Fund is administered directly with state housing there. Uh, they utilize their dollars to assist many times with the supportive housing um, projects. And then the small rental development program, those are for um, projects from four units to 39 units, multifamily. Uh, and then of course we have the National Housing Trust Fund. And they, m many times they use those dollars in partnership with a fund of their small rental development program. These are the two contact person that you wanna speak with if you want more information um, about those programs listed there. A couple of things I just wanna add, um, cash flow. If you're gonna come in in an investment position, it is so key that you show us or that we help you figure out how you're gonna cash flow and make money because it is a business and even a nonprofit needs to make money. Um, I, I, back in the day, folks used to say, well, it's a nonprofit, I don't need to make, re oh, no, no, no. Because you gotta pay for all of the things that you're doing and you want to be able to have extra money that you can put back into the um, into the company, um, and so Renee Long. Oh, I just wanted you to raise your hand. That's <laughs> Renee, and y'all can talk to her when we get to the four o'clock. All right, I am going to now turn it over to um, finding tenants and getting paid, and that's going to be Mr. Ernest Brown, and he's the interim vice president at Columbia Housing Authority. Uh, hello everyone, I am uh, Ernest Brown, the um, Interim VP of the um, Housing Insurance Voucher Program. Not only Ms. Bean is here, so I can't fill her shoes, but I'll try my best. You know, I'll try my best. Um, so the Housing Insurance Voucher Program is, uh, we administer about 34, um, 3,400 vouchers to the families here in uh, Richland County. Um, one of the things we talk about is the uh, new um, FMRs have come out. Payment standards are huge. Landlords really, really look at our payment standards and say, hey, what's up with the payment standards? Can, we you, can you explain to folks who may not know what payment standards are? Yes. So our payment standards right now, we have um, approval from HUD to have our payment standards at 120%. Um, because we found that a lot of the families were having difficulty finding units at some of the lower payment standards. So when we say a payment standard, you may see a payment standard of 1243. So I just want folks to be clear when they look at that payment standard, that does not mean that your rent needs to be 1243. It simply means um, we take into account utilities. Families do have utilities, so we take into account if that family has to pay lights, water, you know, and we deduct that from that payment standard. So I normally balance them out. We try to give them a high, we give them a high utility burden in the beginning when we do that, just to make sure if a family provides us, um, comes to us for assistance, we wanna make sure that the home is affordable to them. They will be paying 30% of their income, no more than 40% of their adjusted income. Wait, wait, wait. How do y'all define affordability? Okay, so we... <laughs> no, 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 it's yes. just, just affordability. It's a bank standard, and people, there's so many thoughts on what affordable housing is. Yes. But I do need you to repeat how you define affordability. Okay, so what we do to define affordability, so say a family has two children. Um, they're uh, under the age of 18. So we take their income, we use the gross of their income, we multiply that, uh, we take the gross first. And then if they have two dependents, they get an allowance for their dependents, which is $480 per dependent. So we subtract that from their income. We take that um, income, then we, that new amount, we divide that by 12, and that's gonna be their adjusted income. And then we take times 0.30 to say what their TTP is, meaning that 
they will not pay no more than 30% of the adjusted income. So if a family makes $15,000 income, they have two children, we take 480, 480 away. It's 960. So we take that away from that 15,000. You multiply that times 12. That is going to give us their adjusted income. Okay. And at that point, we then take 30% of that and that will be what they will pay on their rent. So someone who comes in with no income, they cannot get a unit that's over 1495. So if they come with us and say they want to rent a home that is 1500 and it's at a two bedroom, we'll say that's not going to be affordable for you because that's over your payment standard. So we take that income. So someone comes in with no income and we give a two bedroom unit. We take out around $215 for utilities. So someone can come to you, two bedroom voucher for renters or whoever and say, Hey, I have no income, but I do have a voucher with the housing authority. You can take away $217, and that should let you know what's going to be affordable for that family and what we're going to approve for rent for that family. Okay, and I guess my question may be different. How do a lot of folks, if they're going to use this, use this way, um, how do they determine how much they can collect for rent or how much the housing authority I want to say, no, Columbia Housing mm -hmm. will provide to them monthly in reimbursement because my understanding is y'all, um, Yvonne, got the number up a little bit higher. Yeah, we got but, that 120. So it really depends on families with income or if they don't have income because it could well, vary. Let's look at people with income and so, let's do um, $40,000, two kids. $40,000 and two kids, they can possibly get $1,495 because they have the income to back, you know, to kind of support that. So folks who have income, you probably can get a rental for $14.95. So um, with and income- that, And I'm sorry, mm -hmm. does that mean that is what housing authority will pay? We may not pay $14.95 that person. If they have income, they're still gonna pay 30% of that adjusted income. We won't be paying their full rent, but we will, pay pay, we will pay the difference. And those are the families that we, uh, you know, introduced to a home, our home ownership program. So we let them know you need to take advantage of home ownership. It's normally we're out of five year process. I'm not the, you know, the expertise in home ownership, but I know what they do is they get an escrow. So as they pay in their rent, that money goes into an escrow. So they earn interest on that. And when they complete the program, that's money that can help them with closing costs. It can help them with buying new you know, furniture, whatever they want to use it for, they get that money after they complete that program. And no one can be a part of the home ownership program. They must be employed and gaining income. Say that one more time. I like that. Yes. No one can be a part of the home ownership program. You must be employed and earning income. Can't be Social Security. It has to be earned income. Okay. Earned income. Next, next slide. Next slide. All right. That's your, that's your next end there. That's, it. That's when I, I take it. Um, so here we go. We talk about rent determination, which kind of wraps up what we talk about. We go in our payment standards. Um, then we go to the participants' income and their household composition. Um, then we go to the affordability of the participant. And then the rental market comparables. Very important with comparables. A lot of times, um, some folks will say this person has a housing choice voucher. Um, they see $14.95 and they say, I want my rent to be $14.95. But you must have comps to match that. You know, we're not just going to give you $14.95 because the person has a voucher. So we do do comps for your unit. And if we can find comps to match your rent, then we will approve that rent. Um, another great thing for landlords, they do have the option to do a rental increase every year. Um, all you have to do is just notify your tenant that you are request to do a rental increase. It's normally effective 60 days after you present it to us. So I tell folks, if you want to do a rent increase at the beginning of your lease, just make sure you do it 60 days before your lease renews. And if we can find comps and it works, we'll normally grant that rent increase to our landlords. And I believe that's it. The only thing I want to just touch on is not in the ACV department, but I just want to know if you have any families that are looking for senior housing 62 and above. We still have our waiting list open for the Haven at uh, Palmer Point. It's open till the 31st. And where is that? Uh, it's the new construction behind DSS. Street. So there's about close to 400 units and we are actively taking applications. 
So let folks know 62 and above they can apply for that uh, waiting list. Okay? All right. Thank you. Yeah, yes, right on two notches. That's what I was about to say. Yes, yes. right on two notches. Right notch. behind DSS as you drive, you'll see that new construction. Mm -hmm. Very, very unique. It has a, a pickleball court, a dog park, and it's not what you normally see for public housing, so it's really top notch. So tell folks to apply. It's a haven at uh, Palmer Point. Okay. 62. 62 and above. 62 and above. All right. Thank you. So a quick thing before we open up for questions, because I, I do know if folks want to leave, they should be able to leave. Um, one of the things that, so I was on Section 8, okay, and I often tell people, some people know, some people don't. I'm a teen mom. Um, that's why I look so young. Because um, <laughs> some people forget to say that when they, they forget to say, oh, you don't look old enough to have a 30-year-old. Um, but I decided to go to law school. I lived in North Carolina. I went to undergrad in Raleigh. Um, I did not want to come home to South Carolina. I just I didn't want to come home to Mama. So I stayed there, and I applied for public housing and the Section 8 voucher. I applied when I got pregnant in 1994. I applied for public housing. I did not get my housing until 1996, two years later. But it worked out perfectly because that's when I started law school. And then it took three years to get a Section 8 voucher. So my first year of law school, I lived in public housing. Some people thought that I wasn't going to be able to make it. But I was really good. I really, really was. And then um, I was had a Section 8 voucher for the last three years. And then, because I was in school, right, uh, by the time I graduated and passed the bar, I was no longer eligible for the Section 8 voucher. And to me, that is one of the examples of how we can really use um, this system and the money that is there to change the trajectory of your life. I would have had to come back to Columbia, South Carolina and live with my mama, which I ended up doing anyway, but I didn't. <laughs> I, did, I just put it off for four years. But that is also why I'm, I'm very um, committed to using all of the resources that we have to benefit our community. The other thing is, it's an ability, it's when, if you do Section 8, um, and some of you all, I don't, well, the last time I explained, um, I lived in the Parsonage. I told y'all we moved a little bit. Family Churches Reed Chapel. We lived in the Parsonage um, on Gabriel Street um, because, I, I won't say that, pastors started moving away from some of the communities we were in, but I guess I'm not supposed to say that part. <laughs> um, but if something went wrong, like, I mean, really, me and my mama, oh, my child, we cutting grass and trimming hedges no, uh, Deacon uh, Washington on the corner, who was a member of the church, took care of the grass. Um, if something happened with a doorknob or something broke, it was a church member, it was Mr. Washington, who came and took care of it. And so to me, I truly see that as a way to do ministry in a different way and to reach some families that right now we don't even know how to reach. And if you can guarantee that the rent payment will be there, I just think it makes it all the wow. And so I told folks that's kind of like my vision as opposed to folks from New York and California owning property and renting it. What if we owned the property and rented it in our area? Last thing I will say is um, it's so important with the purchasing of property, even if you're on Section 8, because I don't know about y'all, but I just believe that if you have worked for 30 years and 40 hours a week, 30 years, you should be able to have something at the end of your 30 years. But because of the cost of housing, we have so many people who um, are making, you know, seven, you know, making minimum wage, and they can work 50 years, 50 years, and pay rent for 50 years. But because nothing that we have is affordable, they never own anything. So what does that do? That just, that just creates a cycle. That, that doesn't help anybody get ahead. Last thing I'll say um, is also understanding with affordable housing and trying to find ways to make it cheaper. Um, because if you want to buy a house, you got to save money. Um, I had, we had a city worker. Um, uh, he told me that 
you know, he was actually contemplating leaving work. He says he takes home, nets uh, $1,000 two times a month, 2000 But his apartment rental was 1000 And that's just, reg- that's just regular people. You know what I'm saying? That's a regular job, regular people. Um, and so in that situation, he will always be in that cycle. It's something that if the income doesn't go up, um, or if the prices don't go down. And I also tell people, everybody don't want to have these stressful jobs that, that, that pay, you know, we think pay a lot of money. They want to do what they enjoy doing. And I just believe you should be able to work one job 40 hours a week and be able to, at the end of 30, 40 years, have something to show for it. So I want to thank you all so much for being here. Um, I did, I hope that you all saw the handout. Um, I wanted to, this it says uh, area median income for a person for Richland County. Um, I do this because a lot of times, again, affordable means no more than 30% of your income. That's what affordable is. Like, because we need you to be able to, if you're going to get in an apartment or a house, we need you to be able to stay in it, right? That is why the bank looks at 30%. Um, but a lot of folks think that affordable means low income. And that's not necessarily what that means. So if on this chart, um, our area median income is $60,812. That's the median, which means you have folks that are less and folks that are more. And remind me, Mr. Brown, do y'all do 15% or do y'all do different levels? Of the uh, income? Yes, your income cap. 30%. No more than 40% of they're in a unit that's larger than their voucher size. Okay. So if you look on this list and it says 30%, that is where folks will fall. I know people who make $26,000. Um, I know a family of three, that's a mama and two kids, who make less than $62,000. I mean, I, that's very practical here in South Carolina. And then I have given you some of our city jobs. But this is just a resource because people just assume affordable means low income. It does not. Affordable means we want you to be able to stay in it, maintain it um, as long as you want to and not get evicted. So with that, I am, okay, Shanique had some announcements. It's 4.05, so I'm five minutes behind, but it's not my fault. Um, We want to make sure that you fill out the survey. Did everyone get the survey? Please make sure you get that. Also, please make sure, um, I think that they're sending around another sign-in sheet. Please make sure to sign in because um, we have a series. We'll do different ones. Different people are interested in doing different things. Plus, we want to be able to provide you some information. Like, I want to send y'all the the funding resources. So, questions. Um, Any questions? Well, first of all, if you need to leave, you can. After you sign, make sure that Shanique has your information.